Hi, I'm Danny Schechter, your news dissector, back again here on Media Channel with another interview, one of a series that we hope to be doing with people in the media, writers, editors, journalists, and critics. And today we're happy to have Peter Hart, the director of activism of FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, an organization that's been on the job for many years. And we'll hear more about what they do and how they see the media today. Peter, just tell us about FAIR and what FAIR is doing and what it's been doing over the years and how uh, you see the media scene today. You know, why is it important to do what you do? Well, FAIR's been doing what we do for a little over 25 years now. The concept is pretty straightforward. You want to document and dissect what's going on in the corporate media and try to talk about it in ways that can help expand the discussion. So not just talk about what the media are getting wrong, the omissions, the slights, you also want to bring up the ideas that they should be talking about, that they aren't talking about, the people whose perspectives are missing from the discussion. So it really has two functions in a way, to sort of document the job they're doing and to point toward ways that the corporate media can improve. That said, over 25 years, people always ask you, you know, has the media gotten better or worse with the proliferation of critics? Like, And your answer? Mostly worse. <laughs> I, I would share that view. <laughs> and, you know, a, a lot of us who've been doing this for a long time, um, we take comfort in the fact that people are more media literate now than they were probably in the 1980s when FAIR started. So that, I think the people are getting smarter, the media are getting worse. At the same time, there seems to be a kind of a feeling that somehow it isn't important to cover, you know, the old media anymore because the new media is so much more exciting and that's what younger people are watching. And so there's a tendency to sort of belittle the importance of monitoring a media coverage and analyzing its impact. I think you're, you're right. And it's something that's a constant source of frustration for those of us who still are reading the dinosaur media, you know, picking up a copy of the New York Times. No one watches the network news, we're told. And yet, if you combine all those three newscasts, you're talking 20, 25 million Americans. Uh, so it does have an impact. Uh, I reject that idea that you can just tune out the mainstream media and listen to a lot of podcasts and you'll get a better sense of the world. You'll be better informed, but the rest of the world is continuing to, to consume this media. Well, is it because of the, uh, you know, Twitterati phenomenon? Not, not so much the value of Twitter, but the idea that if it's over 140 words, you don't have to pay any attention to it. Everything is sort of packaged in a simpler format. And in a way, what's being lost here, it seems to me, is context and background. So people have opinions, but sometimes they're not anchored in understanding. One of the things that has, I think, frustrated a lot of old timers about the media is this, the sense that everyone's a pundit. And you watch television, and it's a couple of uninformed or ill-informed yahoos who have a job talking on television. And we reject that as an approach to informing the public. We shouldn't embrace it, uh, you know, in the term, the, the, in the sense of creating 1,000 more pundits out there. People need information and they need context, they need analysis, they need that history. And if they can't get it from the independent media and the corporate media, then there's a problem. So our duty as people who pay attention to the media and as people who produce media is to try to give them that. Just give us a little insight into how FAIR itself is organized. How many people are involved with FAIR? How do you manage to survive and sustain your work over all these years? I mean, it's an incredible achievement. And at the same time, it seems to be driven by a tremendous amount of dedication. You know, the, the staff doesn't change. And I think that's something that people find sort of remarkable. There's five or six people who are working more or less full time. Uh, I've been there almost 15 years and I'm still in many ways the new guy. Um, FAIR is a collective. We sit down and decide what we want to do ourselves and we go about doing it. Uh, you have to have a certain level of commitment to consuming a lot of media. And I think that's true no matter what kind of journalism you're doing. You have to read and you have to watch a lot to inform yourself. And for us that means watching a lot and reading a lot of media that might frustrate us. One of the things that FAIR does that I found interesting, and because I worked in mainstream media at ABC, CNN, and elsewhere, and I know the mindset of a lot of the people who continue to work in, in mainstream media, you make a critique and you present it to the people who you're criti critiquing, and sometimes they even respond. Oh, sure, all the time. Uh, and it's, as you can imagine, it's not always a, a pleasant interaction that you have. 
But over the years, you've found that there are good people working in bad institutions, trying to do their best. The trick, I think, is to deliver a critique that appeals to people who are skeptical or even hostile toward the mainstream media, but also is not going to be rejected out of hand by the reporters that you're writing about. So you have to have some respect, in, in a way, for, for the work of professionals who certainly don't see themselves as part of an evil empire. They see themselves as working journalists, and sometimes they're insulated in their own bubbles, so they don't really hear the critical views. When I worked at ABC, I was happy when people would critique what I, what I was doing or say they want more of it and all the rest of that. that. That helped us, actually, on the inside, get to do better work. Yeah, and I think the bubble analogy is correct because they are trapped in this sort of beltway bubble, the consensus, the conventional wisdom. And to the extent that critics can kind of pierce that and say, here's a different way of looking at it. The Iraq War is a great example. Why aren't you talking to people who are critical or skeptical of this war? Why aren't you talking to protesters? The media didn't want to hear that at the time, but as the truth about WMDs was revealed, I think most reporters, you know, they didn't stand up and say we were wrong, most of them, but they did understand that we had a point and we were trying to expand the debate not to vilify or you know, demonize I, I them. think the frustration, of course, you know, I wrote two books about the media coverage of Iraq and I made a movie, WMD, and yet you see the same pattern of coverage continuing with Iran or with Korea or, you know, that the same mindset seems to be guiding the coverage as if no one ever learns from the criticisms and even their own self-criticisms. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the price? You have to ask yourself, what was the price for being wrong about Iraq? Uh, who lost their jobs? We can point to Judy Miller, I guess, at the New York Times, but who else? There is no path to promotion in the media by sticking your neck out and saying, wait a second, this drive to war is madness. That's not the way to further your career. And there's no evidence that anyone did achieve professional uh, uh, stature by opposing the Iraq war. A lot of people who are wrong about Iraq continue to be wrong about other things and they still have jobs. But, you know, FAIR does seem to be innovating. You know, you did a radio show and you've done it for many years, Counterspin, but now you're doing a TV show. Tell me about that. Peter Hart, TV commentator. Well, you know, we've been approached for years about recording the radio show as television. You know, and there are public access stations that said, why don't you just put a camera in and we'll watch the radio show? The thing about watching a radio show is that it's not that exciting. Um, no offense to the Don Imus program or anything yeah, like that. Be careful what you say. You're on a radio <laughs> show on a website now. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but what we, what we thought was we could build something new and try to adapt what we do to a different format. Because a radio show is a radio show. TV is something very different. So we're at the very beginning of what I hope is a process where we can build out a, a way of talking about the media in a televised fashion and not just recording a TV show in front of a... I mean, I mean, it is interesting that, you know, we've been laboring for many years, you know, uh, what FAIR does, what I try to do, you know, to be critical of the media. And along comes Jon Stewart and puts it in an entertainment <laughs> format and suddenly becomes the most popular show uh, among, you know, uh, news commentary programs in the world, probably. And he uses clips from the media and he indicts them for what they're doing. Uh, and people sort of laugh at it. There's a danger of that, too, because then everything becomes just a big joke. Yeah, you know, I, I think he's done more to further the cause of media criticism than, than many people, perhaps anyone. Uh, what we hope is that the criticism is substantive, and often it is on the program. Uh, but what the rest of us who've been doing this long before there was a Daily Show have to do, I think, is, is not try to be as funny as Jon Stewart. We're, we're going to fail in that. Uh, but to try to peel off some of that audience that finds that criticism of the media striking uh, and they're exposed to this idea, but they want more substance. Uh, and that's, I think, the role we can play. And that's, the, 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 I think, the beauty of all of this is that people are coming at this from all different angles and we're building a, a much more diverse interesting media environment. After I did the WMD film, I, you know, I started looking into financial issues and I made In Debt We Trust mm -hmm. and then Plunder. And one of the things I'm missing, you know, from FAIR and from other media watch groups is some sort of serious analysis of financial media and to try to increase the financial literacy of activists uh, because I don't see that happening very much. I tried to do a a panel at a media reform conference. There was no interest, you know, mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. their part. It seems to me this is something that is really important. You have great websites like Naked Capitalism and others, 
but where is the media critics? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think that's a good point. And uh, Dean Baker, the economist and the media critic at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, was one of the only voices pointing to the, the housing bubble and, and, and warning that there could be a serious catastrophe headed our way. He was right. Uh, you know, there aren't TV shows starring Dean Baker because, you know, he, yeah, well, he still labors sort of off. Well, the title of his work is Beat the Press. <laughs> exactly. uh, Beat the Press doesn't go over too well with the press. It turns uh, out. It turns uh, out. Unfortunately, but it is but the, it's the story of our time. And I remember talking to this L.A. Times reporter about Enron, and I think this gets to it, is that the genius of Enron before it collapsed was that they convinced reporters that what they were doing was so complicated, so complex, that they couldn't even explain it to people like us. And reporters internalized that and thought, well, these guys are making money. They must know what they're doing. So I think they've managed to wall off the financial sector and say, you people can't even understand what we're doing. And it's, our, it's a challenge for the rest of us to figure out, no, you know, it's smoke and mirrors and we need to point that out. Well, I'm, I'm proud to see that many independent filmmakers have taken on some of these issues with films about, you know, not only Enron, but, but aspects of the financial crisis and collapse that have gotten an audience and are, are really doing a lot to promote awareness that you don't find on television and often you don't find in the left media. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it's, I think it remains the issue of, of our time and when we talk about even progressive critics of Obama and, and sort of of the Beltway say, you know, there's not a concern about the jobs crisis in this country. Well, if you feel that that's missing from the conversation, then you've got to do something about it. You're an activism director, which is an interesting title. I don't think there are many organizations that have activism directors. Maybe there should be more of them. But what kind of activism are you promoting? What can we do about this beast, the media? I mean, you know, we have a news, you know, a, a, a news site called Daily Beast. I mean, you know, sort of calling it a beast is now sort of taken with the territory. <laughs> but what can we do about it? Well, what we've always promoted is the idea that you don't just consume and analyze media, uh, you do something about it. And whether that means writing letters, emails, um, causing a Twitter storm, protesting in front of the media outlets, you know, you, you've been there with us. These are all things that you can do to speak up and speak out about the problems with the media. So it's, it's important not to think of your work as... as exclusively as journalism or as the work of a think tank, but to say we can take the fight directly to these media outlets and put it back in their face. You know, one reason that we've brought MediaChannel.org back is because we have a kind of global perspective on media, and we think that there's a lot of writing and analysis and criticizing of the media from all around the world that Americans don't see very much, and we're trying to present that on MediaChannel.org. And, you know, we think that's still very important. and and. You know, unfortunately, we still live in a very parochial culture and country. We just had the death of Margaret Thatcher. And you watch, you know, the, the coverage on CNN, you know, it was sort of reverential. It was, you know, it was almost like singing her praises as if there had been no concern. I mean, you had this, this orgasm of, of positivity about Margaret Thatcher. And The Guardian had an article about people in the streets in Brixton, Glasgow and other places with big signs saying the bitch is back, you know, saying rejoice. In other words, there's still a class conflict like within the media itself where the people at the top identify with the people in power and the people who are not in power are struggling to get heard in the media. You know, if you look at The Guardian's website, the Thatcher rule in charts, Poverty's up over her rule. Um, unemployment was up and then down. It basically was the same as from when she, she took office. Uh, inequality skyrocketing. There are people who suffered during the Thatcher years. Those are the people who are invisible in our media. And it is parochial in a way and kind of bizarre because we have no skin in this game. You know, American media can present a more robust, more inclusive discussion of Britain if they want to. Uh, but it did feel like uh, a member of the royal family died. I was watching the PBS NewsHour. It was three conservatives talking about how great she was, uh, one of them talking about her, her sex appeal. Uh, that's, yeah, that's public television. It was indistinguishable from Fox News last night. Well, I think your voice is why we need a fair. Your voice, the voice of your colleagues in critiquing the media, but also calling on the rest of us to get involved, not just to you know, grumble about how bad it all is, but to actually try to confront it, do what we can, 
to make media an issue, to care about uh, what's happening and to treat with respect the journalists and others who are trying to bring us the truth in a time in which truth is a commodity that's in very short supply. Thanks so much, Peter, for joining us on MediaChannel.org. My, my pleasure. Great.